Hey guys, this is gonna be a lot of fun and read some Instagram comments. I love that you guys comment. I think it's really, really cool. And I love the differing opinions. I, I would say that I'm not at all offended by someone who doesn't agree with what I say or the way that I do things. Uh, but we're gonna, we're gonna go through a couple. Uh, this one is from Billy B. Mack, uh, and I appreciate the question. Uh, the question is, how do you teach him to keep his head so low? I'd like to see a video of that. I have a young stud colt that I'm fixing to start working on, and I'd like to have his head lower. My initial response is they come like that. You know, uh, if their build, if their neck comes out of their shoulders, that low headed uh, kind of drapes there naturally. That white horse that you've commented on, his neck just comes out of his shoulders that way. You know, I actually spend a lot of time picking him up and, and lifting him because naturally he would drag his head on the ground, you know, and if I don't lift him and keep his withers up, I find that low headed can cause you a lot of problems. If they're naturally low headed, you run into this feeling that they go downhill from their tail, down through the saddle, down through their shoulders, into their face. So you have to watch that you don't focus on low headed and, and try to get them to drag their nose in the ground because you run the risk of them actually getting front heavy and hanging down there. The marked difference is that low headed is okay as long as your back and your withers are lifted up. You see the wither in a reining horse should be the highest point. I kind of imagine that there's a clothespin on his withers, you know, that lifts him up and he kind of drapes from there. And that's how I do that. Now, I do work on getting them round and lifting their back. And, you know, when I put my leg on and squeeze their belly and lift their rib cage, you're going to find that they go low headed as a byproduct of getting their hind end underneath them and getting them to drive up from behind and getting their back round, you know, from their tail through their back should be a round curve. And if you follow that curve through now, as you drive that horse from the back, you'll find that the neck starts to hang here like this. And so I tend to get the body really good, really get them laterally soft. You know, when I take my right rein, put my right leg on that horse should come away from the rein and the leg on both sides. You get his rib cage really soft. You start to pick his rib cage up on both sides with your leg and then that low headedness becomes a, a byproduct of getting his body round and lifted. Bah! And now we have a peanut gallery. This one says, you know, it's been a subject between people I know. One doesn't like them bent out of the circle. One really wants them bent toward the circle. What's your opinion on headsets in your spins? Uh, that's an interesting question. I would say every horse is individual. Some of them turn really good hooked up to the inside and they just move their shoulders and they keep themselves upright. You know, I really think it's important that the footwork is right. You've got to keep that inside front foot stepping under and, and back a little bit to keep them really in that shape. If they get their front feet out in front of them too, too far, they're going to start to scramble a little bit and, and not stay round. Uh, if you take a horse that's long and typically a little bit stiff, you're going to find the more you bend him to the inside, the more he has a tendency to hang his rib cage to the outside. So now you have that possibility that he stands on that outside hind leg and he leaves his rib cage behind and you have that feeling you really have to chase him with your outside leg. That's the kind of horse that I would pick up the outside rein and get his rib cage in and keep him really, really turning straight. Every horse is a little bit different. You know, some of them are really boxy and square and, and built. And my, my joke is always, you know, you have you ever tried to bend a beach ball over your knee? You know, if you get one of them really round horses that's just super muscle bound and square and, and thick and I mean, trying to get him to have any sort of shape in the spin is probably causing you problems. So get that horse to just come away from your outside rein and respect that outside rein. You know, then you're working on that outside front leg in the spin, really following your hand and, and being committed. To me, willingly guided and dictated to completely with little or no apparent resistance. If you take your hand to the left and you start to turn and the horse turns great, but he leaves his head looking the other direction, to me, that's not willingly guided. To me, he doesn't look like he's committed to that spin. And so that gives me the impression that he kind of wants to go the other way or he doesn't really want to commit to the direction you've asked him to go. And in that case would not, for me, be very willingly guided. Uh, this one, and I, I apologize for this, I mean, you're in a bad way if you've been you know yelled at for posting and had to spend a year struggling i don't know your situation maybe sitting the trot for a year was exactly what you needed to do i'm for sure not going to throw your coach under the bus for me sitting trot rising trot posting trot working trot whatever you want to call it uh, there is no way that it's exclusively an english thing or a western thing uh, for me it's the horse movement uh, long trotting in western horses and reining horses is a very very positive thing it's a very useful tool 
And I mean, I ride 12 or 15 horses in a day. By no means am I going to force myself to sit some of those trots, you know. At the end of the day, uh, you know, I'm gonna lose a tooth and my eyeballs on a spring over here. And you know, you're pounding on that horse's back. If he's not a good mover, if he's not a smooth mover, just post and move him out and try to get him looser, try to get him to stretch out and move somewhere. In my mind, I'm always training that horse to be the best horse it can be. And rising trot, posting trot is very much a tool. I, I don't care a bit about what discipline you're in it's very much what that horse needs some days you're gonna sit the trot some days you're gonna post or rising trot i also probably use it as a cue you know if i'm rising trot that horse should move out and stretch out and stretch down and go somewhere if i sit the trot that horse should come back to me and, and what we call in the western should jog you know so there's there's a difference there will it matter in the show pen you know can you post on your western pleasure horse no you've you've got to sit there are rules about certain show events but in the reining, when you jog into center for like pattern 11, which is a mandatory trot in, mandatory jog in, you can post if you need to. I mean, there's nothing against that at all. The thing with reining is that we really don't do any trotting. You know, if you trot in a reining pattern other than a mandatory trot in, you have problems, you know, you're, you're in the penalty box. So reining is done entirely at the lope. We never really address rising trot or sitting trots for, for anything in the pen. But as a training technique, it's very important to be able to do both. And I think as a, as a core strengthening for you as a rider, I mean, posting trot's a very good way to get independent with your seat and get strong through your core and make sure that you're balanced all the time on your horse. All right, well, this is gonna be, this is gonna be a good one. This is Lexi the Lemur. I appreciate all of your comments. Uh, you know, uh, you've definitely gone through a lot of them and uh, you know, I'm, I'm not entirely sure if you've, uh, have you trained horses or do you train rodents or I don't know, what's a lemur? The striped tail lives in the jungle. Anyway, I appreciate your comments. I mean, it's, it's fun to have you uh, along for the ride. I don't know about bitless, but guys, please don't do this with bits. It puts much more pressure on the horse's mouth, often to the point of pain. So the comment was on a video in the Bozelle where Donna has her hands wide and she's talking about keeping the horse's shoulders between the reins. Uh, I would say that, you know, this has nothing to do with the width of the hands. If you look at a curb bit or you look at a snaffle or you look at the Bozelle, the Hackamore, uh, they're all built over thousands of years. There's, there's all of this art around bridle making, bit making, you know, how it works in the horse's mouth. There's a ton of science about this. And for thousands of years, people have used bits to train horses and they've adjusted things and changed things and made them work. And, you know, over time, I mean, if, if something really didn't work in a horse's mouth, it, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to train it. It's just like anything. If that horse wasn't comfortable enough to handle it. Now, do bits put pressure on the horse? Absolutely. Does your leg, does the saddle, when you cinch the saddle up, when you put a halter on it and tie it to the wall? I mean, all of these things are pressure. There's no way that you take a horse out of the field and do anything with it without pressuring that horse. And the reason we pressure them is to manipulate their behavior. I mean, that's the whole point of anything that we do is, is we get on the horse or we bring it in with a rope halter and a stick and we do groundwork and we put pressure on it. Whether you're putting physical pressure on it and touching the horse, or whether you're putting an energy kind of a pressure on this horse. Everything that you do is putting pressure on the animal once you remove it from its natural environment. Whether you're riding in the Bozelle or you're riding in a bit or you know, you're riding in your halter and you've tied the rope around to either side. I mean, the thing is, if you handle those reins incorrectly, if you put the incorrect pressure on, it won't matter if you're in a bit or if you're in the hackamore. I mean, I've seen where the chin is rubbed raw from the edges of a bozelle or a hackamore because it's been pulled on and handled and the pressure's been on that pressure point on his chin for too long. So I would argue, and we can have this discussion back and forth, that nothing changes when you widen your hands other than you make it easier for the horse to stay between the reins. And so as the horse gets more broke, you're gonna slowly bring your hands closer and closer together. People talk about riding inside the box and I, I believe in riding inside the box. I get all my horses to be broke one-handed where my, my hand's directly in the middle and it goes a couple inches this way and that way and I wanna use like the six inches of rein from my hand down and, and the pressure of that rein on the hairs of that horse's neck to steer it around. It should become like a joystick to make your horse do what it needs to do. But to get inside that box, you have to ride around with your hands wide. You have to go in my, 
estimation, the way that I think of it, you have to go and gather up all the pieces, all the things, all the stuff that you need and put it in the box. And so I ride with my hands wide to keep all the pieces together. And as I become more comfortable with those pieces being in the box, I can slowly bring my hands closer together. Things don't get away as easy. They don't fall out of the box as easy. As I put everything together over time and through training, I should be able to get my horse to where I can ride one-handed and truly stay inside the box. But I've seen it way too many times where people ride inside the box in spite of the parts of the horse being all over the place. And then it's just putting blinders on and saying, well, see, I'm riding in this way because this is the way that I ride. And it's not you getting feedback from how the horse is reacting or how the horse is feeling or what you're doing with the horse. And I, I struggle with that. So I'm very happy to get outside the box. I'm very happy to do things very wide with my hands, wide with my feet, you know, to make it easier for that horse to stay between the reins. Because if you go narrow too soon, now you have to run with your hands left and right to catch everything and you become really unbalanced. You get over here trying to steer your horse to the wall and then you're over here trying to steer him out of the circle. And if you just keep your hands wide, you can keep your hands this wide and you can use your legs to keep that horse in between the reins. And so you actually are able to get out of his face more often and be less reactive and do things slower because you've widened that field of what you can handle. And you can see that, you know, if you imagine yourself and you imagine, you know, like a baseball diamond kind of a shape going out, you know, if you keep yourself back from your friend, you know, you're trying to catch your friend or you're trying to, you know, work a cow or move an animal. If you stay back from it, you have this wide a field and the, ho the horse or the cow or the person has to travel this far to get outside of that field. You know, the closer you get, the narrower it is, the easier it is for someone to get around you or get past you or for a cow to get around you, get past you. And so the wider you keep that triangle, the easier it is to keep your horse together. And as you come closer and closer and closer together with your hands, you're gonna really struggle if that horse gets with his shoulder out to one side or to the other, and you're gonna to have to go chase it around and try to put it back together. So to recap that one, that's kind of a long one with a lot of ideas in there. I don't think that widening your hands has anything to do with changing the bit or changing the pressure on the horse's mouth. And anyone who's ridden consistently with bits, bridles, training horses, western horses, curbs, shanks, understands those pressures or should understand those pressures. If they don't understand them, it's not the wide hands that are the problem, it's the hands on the reins that are the problem.